My name is Greg. Um, you might know me online as Greg the Greek. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, towards E2 developer tooling. Basically, um, you know, how are you going to go from ETH1 to ETH2, and is it going to work? And what are we going to do about it? So, oh, do I not get a preview here? Okay. So quickly, who's chain? Uh, oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> Who is Chainsafe? Uh, Chainsafe? We're an R&D um, protocol shop out of Toronto, um, about 26 people, mainly in Toronto and a little bit distributed. Uh, and we're working on an ETH2 client called Lodestar. Um, and just who I am, I'm one of the co-founders of VP Engineering. Um, you can find me, Greg the Greek, just about on everything. Uh, and yeah, so what is Lodestar? So Lodestar is a TypeScript and assembly script, uh, basically ETH2 ecosystem. We're building just about everything that we can in there, um, rationale. You know, a lot of when it comes to uh, interacting with blockchains, 90% of the time you're using JavaScript. So we actually, we're going to need the support there. Um, and basically, some of our focuses are on light clients. Uh, the beacon, our, our main focuses are on a beacon chain implementation, light client uh, implementation, uh, which came and had a really good talk on yesterday and highly advised checking out the videos and slides. Um, and as well as dev developer tooling, because naturally, you know, as I said, we're gonna have to interact somehow, and websites mainly do it through JavaScript. Uh, so, um, my agenda is really simple today. Um, we're gonna look at like where we are now, and then how we're gonna try and you know do a migration, some sort of a migration path that makes sense, so that you know everybody working really hard on like their tool sets don't have to rewrite everything, because that would suck, um, and a lot of wasted time. So um, basically, like, where are we right now? Th this slide was so hard to make, by the way. Like, there's way too many like <laughs> teams out there. And if I didn't add your stuff, I'm sorry. This is just like what I typically interact with. Um, but I mean, we have a lot, a whole vast type of um, tooling that exists right now. A lot of it, we have providers like Web3.js, Ethers.js, um, development-related stuff like Truffle, Ganache, SoulC.js. Um, you know, wallets that do a lot of like the hard work for everybody and they don't really realize what they're doing in behind, um, such as like Wallet Connect, MetaMask, Frame, so many more. Uh, really helpful debugging tools like EVM Lab. Um, and some you, you might not know what it is, but it's like helps you really like dive deep into seeing what's going on like within the EVM while you're running, executing your smart contracts. Um, and then obviously there we got like really great websites that like help you build smart contracts like Play and Remix um, that are integral. And one thing to note with like just about all of these things I've listed here, um, I'm pretty sure they all uh, use JavaScript right now, um, and it's like very deeply nested in them for how they make their connections and actually interact uh, with Ethereum. So moving forward, you know, with Ethereum 2.0, there's one big thing that we have to note, and it's that you know our APIs are not at all equivalent. Like zero, like the compatibility is like next to nothing, um, which means that everything we've just listed here uh, would not work right out of the gate. It would actually take quite a lot of an overhaul, borderline a rewrite, um, if we didn't uh, do something to help better support a transitioning period. Um, so that's what I've been focusing on personally. So I've been spending a lot of time personally on, you know, how can we make this a uh, smoother transition for uh, teams who are building quality tools that are used every day. Um, I mean, like I think Ethers alone does like 13,000, has like 13,000 downloads on the little uh, used packages on like the GitHub um, downloads thing, which is like, that, that's a lot of people like depending on, you know, one small piece of software within the larger context of the ecosystem. So um, just like to highlight the example, you know, we have a block in, you know, ETH1 and we don't really have a one-to-one -one equivalent because we have two types of blocks in ETH2. Um, so that's a problem. We also have shards. Shards don't exist, so your ETH1, I don't, I don't know what, you would, what you'd do there, you know? Like, you're, <laughs> what would ethers do when you say get block? Where do you go, you know? There's two blocks, um, and there's also many shards. So, <laughs> and then we have execution environments. I don't even want to touch that, and I won't be touching that today because, like, <laughs> that's something else. Um, but to highlight my point is like there's so many discrepancies that the APIs will never line up and they won't. But there's some things we can do and there's some clever things we can do. Um, so something I've been thinking about as an interim solution, and obviously this is not great. You know, the more I, I've been talking with a lot of teams, um, especially Truffle has been like, no, they want like, they're happy to do like a, like a proper 
uh, baked in solution. But something interim that we could do, um, you, you know, with Ether is what we typically do is you, you pass in, you know, the test net or the network you want to use. Um, and what we can actually do is we can create about a, uh, like an adapter, sort of like that sits right on in the outside and wraps all the requests. Um, and basically the idea behind that, did that slide get in? No. Um, and basically the idea behind that is uh, something that we did at Chainsafe uh, with something called Ethermint from the Cosmos ecosystem where we made the EVM work uh, on top of Tendermint. But naturally, they again, it's kind of a similar situation. They don't line up, but we had to make sure that all the developer tooling like worked right out of the gate so that you could, it was like playing in Ethereum, because um, you know, otherwise why would you use it? Um, so what we did was we basically added this layer in front that every time an API request came into uh, the EVM, or in this case, it would be like when it hits the beacon chain or AL, whatever's there, um, we're basically looking at it and then translating to whatever we think makes the most sense um, from that side. So we can do that with the beacon chain, right, and with this. So chances are you have a contract. You're saying, hey, I want to look up this contract. Um, you're probably, you have to get routed to a shard because that's where your contract's gonna be living, um, and you're gonna have to do it that way. So we can just take like a generic request uh, from you know, the standard ETH1 API and like rewrap it and pop it back up. That works, it's not great. You know? we, that would mean every client team would have to go and adopt this, like a interface sitting in front of their current, whatever we end up making the ETH2 API, whether it's JSON RPC, you know, whatever. Um, it, it, it does the job, it's not, great, you know, we could also integrate directly into the providers, you know, we could directly put it into ethers. Again, not the optimal solution. Um, well, this is something we're thinking about. Uh, ideally, we're gonna have to do some sort of a ground up rewrite um, on our providers, and if we can do it from the provider's perspective, then we actually save ourselves. As long as the providers maintain the same API format, and then we're just doing a lot of magic in behind, we actually won't have to rewrite a lot of our dev tooling, and like dev teams can continue to operate as they did before. Um, naturally, it'd be nice to get some like native, you know, ETH2 tooling, but to help ease the transition over, uh, this is one of something along this line will probably have to be the best best case we can do. Um, otherwise, we just won't have anything ready by the time ETH2 launches, and there's no point in spending resources doing twice. Um, so that's my little provider show, um, and I'm happy to talk about this a lot more after. Uh, Something else uh, that's kind of interesting, and this is funny, you know, it's like, hey, maybe we can solve it after 30 years, but we won't, um, is the intersection of like, like clients and developer tooling and how we can actually potentially make smarter developers. Um, and by this, I mean like more on the front end, the D app side, because right now, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of our, the ways we do things, we do a lot of polling, for instance. A lot of developers like go and pull the chain like a million times over and a million times over. And then like, you know, if they're hitting Infura, then you're getting like, you're bombarding Infura with like, thousands of requests. It's not a great solution. Um, but moving forward, because, uh, you know, light clients are becoming our first class citizens in ETH2, which means we actually can use this as like a powerful tool to help us, you know, not exhaust resources and actually utilize only what we need um, to, you know, serve our dApps or serve whatever the application is uh, moving forward. Um, so I've Naively put, you know, we're still working on this and it's kind of like, I want to try, we're trying to think of a new way to like reshape the way we interact with the chain. Um, I don't want to go too deep on like clients, but like it just, so basically the idea is you subscribe to a shard that you want or a subset of shards that you want and you only get the relevant data that you need. Very lightly put. <laughs> um, and something that we can do here is the current model and flow in ETH1 is that, you know, the website connects to the provider, the provider then hits uh, a full node, has to, the full node has to like basically index the whole thing to find what exact information you need and then returns it. Very slow, very cumbersome. With light clients, what we can do is we actually can put the burden back on the website or the client or the browser itself. And this is kind of interesting because what we can do is we can do one of two things. We can say, um, when you go onto a website, we can look for, now I know a lot of people are gonna be like, oh, you shouldn't be injecting like Web3 into the browser, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. Um, let's just make a naive assumption. So is there like an ETH2 object in the browser? If there is, we can assume that there's some sort of a provider already existing, and there's like potentially a plugin like MetaMask. In that case, we can uh, MetaMask in this instance would be hosting a light client actually within the plugin. This allows then the website to go and say, "Hey, I need you to subscribe to this shard for me," and then start persisting and maintaining the data. While the, and then you know 
once the data is requested, the website uses it as it's going. While that's happening, we can actually cache you know, that shard data into a cookie, local storage, um, or even if it's a plugin, the plugin state. Um, and alternatively, if we make our providers smart, um, we can then actually have the website itself, if the user doesn't have a plugin, we have the website itself actually spin up a light client. And this is because we're gonna, we will be able to do this simply because we've got languages you know, compiling to Wasm, but also Lodestar's like whole goal is to have a light client that runs in the browser, that's native to the browser and works. So with that, we can actually kind of like exploit the browser to its fullest capabilities so that the burden doesn't go on like a centralized service like Infura. And don't get me wrong, like Infura does, is amazing. You know, it's, we have a lot to thank for them, but let's try and take the burden away from them if we can. Um, and a scheme something like this uh, would definitely help solve a lot of those issues and could potentially change the way we develop um, and serve data. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I, let's uh, chat afterwards if you are a tooling team because like, there's a lot to kind of discuss here. It's still pretty early, but there's things that we need to start talking about now. Um, I know there's a lot of pain points in the current API and the current way uh, ETH1 works um, in regards to like the JSON RPC API. Um, and we have an opportunity to kind of learn from our mistakes, reshape it from the beginning, and, decide, and basically, you know, make it as optimal as we can right out of the gate. Um, so thank you. And you can contact me here. <laughs> <laughs>